can't actually see anybody out there. Um, I, I was so excited when um, Trevor asked me to come to this event and to put together a group of artists to talk to you. Uh, if you look to the right of you right now or to the left of you at the person sitting next to you, they may indeed be an artist. We are among you uh, <laughs> as, as we speak. Um, my, my art practice involves data and, and, and most most specifically, the human experience of data. And, and I think a lot about um, what is it like for, for the everyday person to be in this new world of data. And, and, and maybe because this is a, maybe a biased model because I do a lot of traveling, but I think about the air traffic system as an analogy. So the air traffic system, when, when you're in it and you're traveling is a system of almost unimaginable complexity and we only see it in small glimpses. We see uh, our bags disappearing down these strange runways and, and we see uh, the fueling uh, uh, systems come in and connect to the plane as we're on, on the runway. But we don't really get a feeling of the whole of it. You know, I was surprised to find out when we were working on this project um, that at any given time there are more than a million people in the air. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing this almost respiring system of planes landing and taking off on 15-minute intervals throughout the day. And the second thing that I think about when I think about the air traffic system is I think about this loss of control. It's one of the only times in our lives that we voluntarily give up our control. We're put in these lineups and, 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 and we really do what we are told for a short period of time. And I think that our everyday experience with data may be as similar to this. We are engaging with a very complicated system and we're doing so very much out of our own control. Now, I'm not the first artist to think about this. David Foster Wallace, an American novelist, wrote a book called Infinite Jest. Infinite Jest is a very interesting novel. It, it is, it's full of footnotes. And occasionally those footnotes have footnotes and, and even sometimes those footnotes of the footnotes have footnotes. And when he was asked um, by his editor why he was including this, he responded that he said he wanted to mimic the information flood and data triage that he expected to be an even bigger part of life 15 years hence. And I think that this idea is something that we are all, all of us in this room, wrestling with now, this need and this, um, this desire for data triage. Um, my own work in, it involves quite, um, quite a focus on on how information is used in ways that we may not be aware of. This is a piece that I did a number of years ago called Just Landed. And what I'm doing in Just Landed is I'm looking at tweets that, that you probably have seen if you're on Twitter of people saying, I just landed in Hawaii or I just landed in London. You know, these kind of um, rich person vanity tweets. And I thought we could take these, these vanity tweets and maybe make some utility out of it by using it to, a, to create a model of human travel. And, and this uh, piece has a companion called Good Morning, which is just that. It's everybody on Twitter saying good morning. <laughs> so here are the people who are uh, green, represented by green blocks. Those are people who get up quite early. The people who are red blocks are getting up much later. As we sweep through uh, North America, you see lots of red blocks on the West Coast. So, uh, as, as Trevor mentioned, I worked at the New York Times for two and a half years as the data artist in residence. Some of you are asking this question, so I'll answer it. I made up that title myself. Um, and, and at the Times, we took some of these ideas and we tried to make them into something a little bit more practical. And we built this project called Cascade. And Cascade is a project that looks at how people are, are, are sharing Times content over the internet. So on the bottom left-hand side is the first tweet about this particular story, and what we're seeing is one conversation that surrounds that story. So very much I was interested in how we can we take something that is invisible, that is inherently invisible, and make it into something, make it into an architectural form that we can then think with, that we can engage with, and that we can understand. When I left the Times in January, I started a company called the Office for Creative Research. And with the Office for Creative Research, we're very interested in, in 
changing the way people think about data and changing the way that people experience data. And one of the ways that we do that is by bringing data into public space. This is a piece that we installed. It's a permanent uh, installation at the University of Texas um, called And That's the Way It Is. This is five stories tall and 140 feet wide. It runs every night. And what it does is it does these um, linguistic data games with the content of the news broadcast from every single day. So this is a broadcast from last summer. There were floods in, or um, droughts in Colorado, so we see withering corn, the drought, dry earth, hungry cattle, the worst. And, and as people are standing in front of this building, they're receiving a much different experience of data than the experience that they're used to. And because what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to change the conversation around data. Because the conversation around data, um, as it sits right now, involves, um, involves a lot of terms like this. This is essentially, if you had to distill what I'm trying to do with my work, is I'm trying to provide a counterbalance to this. And this is a phrase that I've heard over and over and over again. The people that are saying it, I think they're thinking about this. <laughs> but I, but I, I, well, I'm, I'm thinking about this as well, but in a context of this, you know, our experience with oil was not a particularly good one. And the idea of data being the new oil may in fact be the case, but not in the context that I think the current conversation is, is, is um, focusing it. So what I was excited about with our opportunity here at Navigate was to bring some artists that will help us think about our conversation around data and privacy in different ways. And so I, I, uh, I rounded up three of, who, uh, of uh, artists who I think are probably the best possible choices that I could, have, I could have made, and I was thrilled that they all said yes. So we have three artists who are going to be working in very different areas. I'm not going to take a lot of time to explain their practice because I'm going to leave it to them. But we have Kyle McDonald, whose work largely surrounds this concept of how do we, how do we see and how are we seen, the act of seeing and the act of being seen. We have Lauren McCarthy, who you're going to see in just a second, whose work involves human interactions and how our human interactions are changing. And finally, we have Heather Dewey Hagberg, who is going to take us into, I think, the future of privacy issues by thinking about very deeply about, um, about topics like DNA. So I invited these artists here. They all said yes. There are a couple of reasons I think they, they said yes, but one of the primary ones, besides legal representation, I think a lot of them are looking for legal representation. Uh, you'll find out why when you see them talk. Uh, I think most of them, and myself included, are primarily excited about the conversations that we can have today. So after we're off the stage, please feel free to come up and talk to us because that's really why we're here, to advance the conversation and to advance the dialogue. So I hope you enjoy uh, what we have, are going to bring to the event, and I look forward to talking to all of you. Thanks. Thanks.